Welcome to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. Like any good marriage, we will debate, evaluate, and sometimes quarrel about how privacy and security impact business in the 21st century. Hi, Jody Daniels here. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors, a certified women's privacy consultancy. I'm a privacy consultant and certified informational privacy professional, providing practical privacy advice to overwhelmed companies. Hello, Justin Daniels here. I am an equity partner at the law firm Baker Donaldson, and I practice technology law. However, I am passionate about helping companies solve complex cyber and privacy challenges during the life cycle of their business. I am the cyber quarterback helping clients design and implement cyber plans, as well as help them manage and recover from data breaches. And this episode is brought to you by Red Clover Advisors. We help companies to comply with data privacy laws and establish customer trust so that they can grow and nurture integrity. We work with companies in a variety of fields, including technology, e-commerce, professional services, and digital media. In short, we use data privacy to transform the way companies do business. Together, we're creating a future where there's greater trust between companies and consumers. To learn more and to check out our best-selling book, Data Reimagined, Building Trust One Bite at a Time, visit redcloveradvisors.com. Well, hello, hello. How are you feeling today? You're tired? I'm I'm rather tired. Our our dog is acting like, um, as an older dog, he's acting like a newborn in the sleeping schedule. I see. I understand. No, you don't. You're sleeping. You know? and I'm tired. Fair enough. Well, he sleeps on my side of the floor. Yes, he does. <laughs> well, he's very loyal to the person that has saved him twice. Mm, it's true. But we're not going to talk about Basil the dog, though. That would be a really fun episode. Maybe we'll let him be the guest. <laughs> Speaking of our guest, uh, we have an interesting show today. We have Roderick Deichler, who is a cybersecurity industry veteran. He's led pen testing engagements at Mandiant and smart contract audits at both Coinbase and Open Zeppelin. He has several top CTF hackathon and competitive audit placements and several assigned CVEs and bug bounties. He co-founded After Dark to help fill the security gap in Web3. Roderick, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thanks. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. And I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Perfect intro. Uh, well, we're excited that you're here and we'd love to dive a little bit deeper into that intro. So we always ask people to share a little bit more about their career journey to how they got to where they are today. And we'd love to hear yours. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I'll go back, I guess, to, to part A, to the, the start. Um, I really got first interested in cybersecurity space in college. Um, I studied computer science undergraduate over at UC Santa Barbara, where they really have a strong uh, cybersecurity research lab. So, you know, one day I just went to check out the hacking club and the rest is kind of history from there. Fast forward, um, I did some work in pen testing uh, and I did some red team consulting, which I think you touched on over at Mandiant. Um, And over there, you know, really we're doing the full gamut of cybersecurity, at least on the offensive end of work, um, doing web application tests, even mobile tests, cloud tests, internals, externals. Um, all the way to red teaming, which is, you know, you're fishing into these companies and then trying to go undetected for the entire time of the engagement and go all the way through their internal network, steal their crown jewels, et cetera. Um, really enjoyed my time there, learned quite a bit, um, but sort of got pulled into this crypto space um, where I think I was just really excited at the idea of, of contributing to something that's this credibly neutral and sort of sufficiently decentralized platform. Um, for, you know, one, sending money, but two, you know, everything beyond, I think we're, we're looking at potentially building all sorts of different applications on top of it that could be stuff for social media replacements, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of what brought me over to working at Coinbase internally um, and then externally again as, a, as an auditor and consultant over at Open Zeppelin, uh, where I really got to help secure some very large protocols in the space. Um, and finally, co-founded After Dark, where we're trying to uh, as you mentioned, you know, fill the gap in security needs in Web3. I find it so fascinating that there's a hacking club at college. When I went to school, it was, you know, the like French club, Spanish club, finance club, save the world club. <laughs> but now it's, it's the hacking club. 
you understand the hackers of the world get together at DEF CON and they got kicked out of a hotel <laughs> because they kept hacking the Wi-Fi and people's phones and the hotels like, we can't have you doing this. I have heard that rumor before. Yeah. So it, it was small. It's a small hacking club. There's about <laughs> seven or eight of us. <laughs> it just shows you the evolution of where we are today. So where I kind of wanted to begin, uh, Roderick, we, we haven't had a guest on in a while to talk about Web3, but maybe you could talk to us a little bit about um, what security risks do we have in smart contracts, which you know are the basis for most blockchain applications. Sure. Yeah. Happy to happy to dive in there. I won't go way too much into the weeds because there is definitely a lot we could talk about on this topic. Um, but I think, you know, something worth touching on is sort of the difference maybe between traditional applications um, and building on top of blockchain. Right. And currently you have you have a couple major things to think about. One of them is the way that transactions are, are sort of processed currently and the way code is executed, if you will, um, is Roughly every node on this distributed system actually is currently running the code itself and then sending out saying like, here, here are the results of all of these state changes. And every other node is like, yes, that makes sense or, or no, it doesn't. And that can be a little bit confusing. Um, one, because, you know, you're spending actual compute power across everybody's actually um, going through the set of transactions here. And two, you, you have to assume the order of those transactions can't really be trusted because how do you know who's processing it first and which one's going to come out first? So that leads to a couple of different interesting um, issues. One of them is it's what we call gas and gas is how users are actually paying for all of this compute. Um, and in smart contracts, you have to make sure that you're not using way too much gas. Otherwise, either your users are going to pay for it or they have this kind of block space limit, which means that you won't even be able to include your transaction. The, the code, sure, it'll be tested to try to be executed, but it won't actually um, post the changes to the chain. So for all intents and purposes, you know, it's not going to go through. Um, and then you also have this idea of touching on a little bit where transactions are coming in different orders. So if you assume like, oh, I you know, am going to send money to person A, um, but only if they had already sent me money, and it's not a really a great assumption to make because that it could come in in a completely different order and then your payment's not going to go through. Um, so in terms of the smart contract risk, right, there's two interesting things there that are really quite different. Uh, there's also another classic issue, which is called reentrancy. Um, and that's, you know, I think a fun way to think about this one is it's like you're playing a video game and you hit pause in the middle of the video game. And then you're just giving your controller off to someone else. You don't even know who. And you're saying, go play, go play this game and then return it to me paused again. And so you need to have a lot of guardrails and what they can or can't do when you hand that controller over. Because, you know, you could come back to the game and you completely lost your save. Um, maybe even, you know, your, your character has is, is died or what, what have you, depending on the game. So... <laughs> It's it's really, you know, kind of a dangerous thing that happens with these smart contracts, but that's called an external call and they're calling into something else that's untrusted. And then they can go back and and call back in and, and change the state just the same. Um, so those are a few issues. I will say we're still seeing a lot of business logic, um, which is something that's a lot more normal to um, any Web2 traditional security folks. Um, and that's just, you know, implementations of things that you're not expecting. Maybe you're an NFT lending protocol. Um, and you say, okay, I'm expecting someone to put up their NFT for collateral, someone else to borrow, et cetera. Um, but you don't expect someone to lend to themselves. And, you know, now you've given them out more money than you actually have in the thing, for example. Um, so without getting way too much in the weeds, you know, there, there are really a lot of differences to think about. It's pretty interesting. Um, and it's a fun space. And, and I'll pass it back to you. We just had fun and security risk in the same conversation. Well, <laughs> well you know what, Roderick, I guess one of the things I wanted to kind of follow up and ask you is, you know, what you do is you go in and you find bugs in code. And I wonder if you could give us, based on your experience, kind of get us in the head of a software developer and what their thought process is to either create an NFT or take any kind of software application. What is their thought process and how do they go about this? And what are some of the gaps? Because obviously the bugs in code, particularly on new types of technology, 
seem to be more and more prevalent, and yet these things make it to the market without having someone like you take a look at it? Is it just simply market forces and these companies are under a lot of pressure to get an MVP? And if there's bugs in it, hey, we'll just figure that out later. We just want to get it in the customer's hands. Sure. Yeah. I think, you know, thought process wise, especially for Web3, like you said, new technology, you're seeing a lot of developers from the Web2 side um, that want to come in and want to participate. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, there's a few nuances that are a little bit unexpected in, in distributed systems, let alone blockchains, um, that can be really hard for you to get in, in the state of mind and to make sure your, your code is free of those issues. Um, in terms of the market forces, I, I think that's absolutely an issue. I, I really like that I think in the Web3 world, we are trying to make it a standard to kind of get security before. A lot of projects, they will do an audit at least, and that's, you know, we're someone like me uh, will come and review their code and look for bugs before they kind of do their initial deployment to production. Um, but still, you know, there's really a race to be early to market, right? And, and benefit from the network effects. And so if you're a project that's a little bit lower funded or bootstrap maybe, um, you might consider deploying first, attracting some users. And then once you actually start to accrue some value and make yourself a, a larger target, only then will you start to go through the security procedures. Um, or the second thing, you know, that people will do to kind of capture the momentum and move quickly is they'll take on what I'll call like centralization risk. And that means basically, you know, as opposed to um, slacking on having like bugs or vulnerabilities directly in the contracts, they'll just say, we have the ability at any time to kind of upgrade these contracts um, or even, you know, if you're an L2 protocol, for example, maybe you don't have what they call fraud proofs or disputes, but but basically it's a little bit against the ethos of, of the ecosystem, I'd say, where decentralization is kind of king. And you're saying we're going to give ourselves some keys and some controls to be able to change things on the fly. Um, so I hope that answered the question. I know I, I threw a couple things out there. Well, sure. I, I, I think it did. You know, since we're talking about security risks, many people are familiar with good old fashioned fishing been around for a long time. But why is fishing even more devastating to those looking or not looking uh, to those holding Bitcoin or other assets in a digital wallet? Yes, yes. So fishing, fishing is definitely a huge problem. Um, and I think there's, there's a few things and a few reasons for that, right? Like, unlike in traditional banking, the transactions, they're really irreversible. Um, there's not kind of this like underlying payment structure that might process in a few days or, you know, these credit protections where you can have chargebacks. There, there really aren't chargebacks. So once the once the transaction and the funds are gone from your wallet, effectively, they are gone. They are they are owned by someone else. Um, and you can try to take legal procedures. Um, it, it gets really difficult for a number of reasons. One, you know, if it's a small amount, like just your own personal savings. There's probably not much you can do on that. It's it's a really high intensive um, and capital intensive thing to try and track someone down, figure out you know whether you can even get the funds back. And the second is you know that's because it's a little bit pseudonymous or anonymous, right? We don't necessarily who's tied on the other end um, where the funds went to. And again, if they're a smaller amount of funds, there are also things like uh, money laundering, chip mixers, etc where you might have a really difficult time tracking down where the funds actually went. Um, I would also say that, you know, on the phishing end, it's you're really conditioned as a user. If you've ever played with any of these wallets like MetaMask, et cetera, uh, you don't really get too much info coming your way as to you're kind of just like, yeah, I'm, I'm at a website interacting with this. And yes, I intended to swap. So click swap. And then, you know, little do you know, you got fished into sending your funds over to, to someone who knows where? And I think it's it's a really difficult thing to protect against. And I think we have a long way from like a user experience perspective to, to make that better. So Roderick, on the point of phishing, I was reading an article this morning about how artificial intelligence is going to make phishing even more uh, robust from the threat actor standpoint, because they can really tailor the emails and make them look authentic. How, if at all, is AI impacting the kind of work that you do or the kinds of code that uh, you are finding the bugs in? Yeah, I would say, you know, AI, is, it's a really big place of investment in our space right now. Um, I've talked to quite a few different founders who are building tooling that's 
basically supposed to help find a lot of these, whether it's pattern matching to find the bugs um, or just, you know, general, I'll call them like lower hanging fruit. And I'm seeing that AI is able to find a lot of extra bugs, um, which is great on my end, because that means instead of spending a lot of my time looking for what I'll call the lower hanging fruit, um, we can look for stuff that really takes a more thorough manual review and understanding of the system. Um, but I would say AI has, is quickly quickly helping the work that we do. And it's it's impressive how much has really changed in the landscape in the past you know year on this. Justin, earlier you were talking about design and how security is considered in the design of different projects. And so, Roderick, I'm curious, are you seeing, is there an appetite to go slower? These are some really big risks. I mean, I have to be honest, you mentioned phishing. I can't get my money back. I, I'm not excited about that idea. So I would imagine other companies <laughs> have a variety of serious concerns while at the same time trying to move their projects quickly out the door and balancing that security piece with what we've been talking about. What have you been seeing from how companies are either changing their security mindset or maybe not at all because there's cool people like you who can find all the problems. <laughs> well, I would not say I can find them all. I, I always strive to find them all. But um, he is cool. He is cool. <laughs> that Thanks, we can agree Justin. on. <laughs> um, but, but to answer your question, yeah, I'd say generally speaking, yes, there is an appetite to go slower. It's It's really important to kind of bake security into the process. Um, I also think, you know, that's largely a product of the, the ramifications are very obvious. Like if you get hacked, you're seeing millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, in the headlines. And it really is happening. Um, some of these protocols are holding a lot, a lot of money and a single bug can lead to all of that being drained in, in a single transaction. So it's, it's really difficult to stop. Um, and then you have to, to hope that you can recover some of it. Right. So. There's definitely an appetite for going a little bit, you know, low and slow, if you will. Um, I'd still say that, unfortunately, there, there are market forces pushing people to get products out. And I think that's something we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, but you're seeing either projects that, that want to deploy immediately um, and just figure out if they have product market fit before they kind of invest in the security. Um, or you're seeing people who will, will cut corners a little bit to kind of take on this centralization risk. Um, but I, I will say happily that I do believe, you know, security is kind of being prioritized a little bit more, even for these early stage startups. That is promising to hear, like my security by design people. Well, it's much like privacy by design. No, but we're talking about security. So I didn't include privacy. I included security. I see. But that was very nice of you to include privacy. Well, it is the privacy and security podcast. I know. Sometimes we lean a little bit more one way than the other way. Yes. This is my, yes. So, Roderick, I apologize for that interlude. Do we were having. apologize? A That's part of the fun. I see. And I get a smile. <laughs> um, so, Roderick, from your perspective, with all the years of your pen testing and hackathon, what is your best cyber tip if we're at a cocktail party and we want to learn more about that? If, yes, if we're at a cocktail party, you know, honestly, I, I think it's, it's keeping it simple back to basics. There's two things. I'll throw in a double tip here. Um, one of them is, is definitely throwing an MFA onto basically any important thing that you're logging into. Um, and specifically, don't, don't do the SMS ones. Don't do the ones that text you um, a code and then you enter the code. And the reason for that is it's really easy to do SIM swapping, what they call it. But essentially, you're taking over someone's number for a short period of time. And I, I've had people that, that I know that have done this. You can just walk into even an AT&T or T-Mobile and convince them that, you know, you need you need to have your um, SIM change to a new phone really quickly, immediately. Some emergency came up and can create a compelling story. Um, anyway, they, they will do that. And if, all it takes is one second for that to happen. And your, your MFA is no longer MFA. It's just if they had your original password, they had it. Um, the second one is I really am a proponent of password managers. Um, and that's because, you know, it's just one, it's really common to not use a strong enough password. Um, and that's, you know, going to open your account up to being brute forced or what have you. Uh, if someone gets a hold of your account, again, not a great situation. 
Um, the second is people will definitely reuse passwords and I can uh, totally understand why you would want to do that. It's, it's a pain to have 40 passwords for one thing. Um, and that's kind of what the password manager is great for. You have one very complex password and then you don't really have to worry about what you have for, you know, the 30 different websites you have to log into these days. You just literally roll the dice and it's going to create a, a very complex string of characters for every individual website that you, you log into. Those are my two tips. So Roderick, I actually wanted to ask you a follow-up with those two tips to, for the benefit of our audience, and it's this. So let's say uh, you're using one of the password managers and one of them has been hacked repeatedly. Uh, it's been in the news. Can you talk to us about how having the MFA with, let's say, a token-based second factor will help you have uh, good cybersecurity? Because once the hacker gets in, let's assume they have your password. However, what is stopping them from using that password to completely change your account when they've taken over your phone? Can you just explain that a little bit in layman's term to our audience, please? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's why, that's why it's a two for one. You, you need both, right? And so the MFA, um, that's, you know, I would advise using an, an application like, you know, Authenticator or even a UBP is fantastic. But the whole idea is, you know, you go to log in, let's pretend it's your bank account credentials. Um, maybe, maybe you used a password manager, like you mentioned, it was breached and now you, someone else has the password to it. When they go there, they're expecting a second form of authentication. And really, that's a fancy way of saying, you know, either through this application, you're going to get a specific um, code that lasts for, you know, 30 seconds um, and you need to enter that. Um, or, you know, you could use a, a YubiKey again, not, not entirely important to the concept, but you cannot just log in from anywhere in the world with just a user's password. You need to have control of a second form of authentication, hence the, the MFA. Um, and doing that, you know, tying that to something like your physical phone or um, a physical key card makes it really difficult for someone who tried to steal your password from, you know, across the world. They, they need to physically have that second component there. And to drive your point home, even if they stole, even if they went to the local wireless store and got my phone number ported to their phone, they would literally have to have the applicator that's on my physical phone to get that set can factor. So without that, They've breached one level of my security, but that second factor is my extra layer of defense that's protecting that account. Is that is that accurate? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And that's why, you know, I'm definitely not an advocate for using SMS as your second factor, because if someone is able to, to get that SIM swapped, which seems to be not too difficult these days, uh, you really only have one factor. Well, when you're not talking about uh, losing millions of dollars in an attack and MFA. What do you like to do for fun? That was such a uh, I am way to say that. <laughs> <laughs> when you're not losing, helping people lose a million. <laughs> well, I mean, we are talking about really significant yes. consequences that can happen. Yes. And when you're not dealing with those types of very big things, Roderick might be doing something fun. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, there definitely are some things I like to do in my free time. Um, one of them is I've recently become a really big foodie. And so uh, my girlfriend and I came back from a trip from the south of France um, a few weeks ago. And we did at least a small tour hitting up some some local restaurants there. And, and the food was really fantastic. So I think, at least in my heart, France has won its title as the culinary capital of the world. Um, but also, we really like to get outdoors. Um, have been doing some kayaking as well. So we're we're local to the Atlanta area. So we've been to Alatoona um, and Lake Lanier, and definitely open to recommendations if if either of you have any for the next spot to check out. I'm going to leave that one to Justin. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's always Lake Oconee is a fun place to go for kayaking. I've never been, but uh, Hartwell's all the way on the other side. Yes, Hartwell too. There you go. There you go. Well, if people would like to learn more about you and After Dark, where can they go? Yes, so we are very active on um, Twitter as well as LinkedIn um, and our website, which is afterdarklabs.xyz. Uh, and that'll have all the info for anybody who's, who's interested. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Justin, any parting thoughts? I thought Roderick gave an excellent explanation of why we want MFA that's not SMS based. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check us out on LinkedIn. See you next time. Thank you.